water, earth, fire. It's hard. I have about 48 chances left, so I'll get it. Is it just me, or did episode 12 set a darker tone that is being carried on in the show? It appears I've been promoted to Admiral. My request is now in order. How's Saka doing? Not so good. Being out in that storm really did a number on him. Nice call back to the last episode. <coughs> oh no. There's that super speed again. All information regarding the Avatar must be reported directly to Admiral Zhao. I've got nothing to report to Zhao. Now get off my ship and let us pass. Zhao, I remember, he's the guy that Zuko fought and then he tried to stab him in the back after Zuko won. So that partially explains Zuko's animosity towards him. Hmm. Seems like he's getting more powerful. Okay? With Zhao's resources, it's just a matter of time before he captures the Avatar. My honor, my throne, my country. I'm about to lose them all. It's understandable in Zuko's situation because it's the only way he can get back into the kingdom. There's some weird effect of being so infatuated with one outcome. It almost makes it doomed not to happen. If you stake your whole identity on, on everything, you become kind of constrained. It's like having blinders on because it makes you effectively not see the rest of the universe or the rest of the options available to you. So Zuko is kind of trapped. He's written himself into a corner here. And it's not his fault, obviously. This was kind of just done to him. He has internalized it in such a way that he'll only be happy if he finds the Avatar, but there's a lot more to his character that we can see, and a lot more options he has that we can see that he can't see. I think that's something very relatable because sometimes when I fixate so strongly on something, it's kind of like I'm, I'm staking my whole life on it, and as soon as I do that, I can't do it well. The stakes are too high, so I can't be fluid, I can't flow in it, I can't be like a cool, creative, interesting, dynamic person in it. So it's not exactly what's happening with Zuko, like, you know, this is a more literal thing he needs to do, but I know that feeling. I have no idea if this applies to this show or not, but weirdly and counterintuitively, the more you let something go, the easier it is to obtain. Not always, but in a lot of cases. One way I feel this way, funnily enough, is in relationships or in romance, let's say, or dating. It's like, if you're so fixated on one person, you can't be yourself around them. If you haven't developed your own thing, independent of that, like if you haven't found, your, found a little bit more of yourself and you know who you have to offer, you have a little bit more confidence, you turn into a complete mess around that person and you, you become someone undesirable because you're so wooden. You have no openness, you have no humor. You're just like this thing that is overwhelmed by emotion. Nobody really wants to be around that. It's like letting go that facilitates getting things. That's like one of the hardest things to learn. That was a tiny point in the show that I extrapolated way out into into left field, but you know, what else is new? You're insane, aren't you? That's right. Speaking of accepting yourself. Oh man. I love this scene and the wind and everything. It's really cool. Wow. I'm loving the look of this scene and the music too. Ooh. Nice, using his water powers. Oh, so they actually got him. See, if you die, you'll just be reborn and the Fire Nation will have to begin its search for the Avatar all over again. I never thought about why they're looking for the Avatar specifically. I just assumed it was to kill them. Seems like there's more to it. Hmm, this guy again. Who's it gonna be? This is the year Sozin's Comet returns! Right, to the Comet. Its power. That's right. Is it another firebender? No, it, yeah. Close all the gates immediately! Stay close to me! Nice. <laughs> That's cute, but good. This is cool. Nice little alliance. Give me the next one. Hold your fire. The avatar must be captured alive. <laughs> that was a really long sequence and it was so well done. In the last video I talked about episode 11. The mistake I see a lot of people make in TV and movies and all sorts of media is they have action and they think the action by itself makes something good. Action without any feeling or thought behind it. It feels so hollow. But that was exciting because obviously we're invested in Aang. And there's also kind of like a time pressure. His friends have a fever and are waiting for him to get back. You have the mystery of this newcomer. You have the chemistry between them. And you have the Fire Nation who also 
clearly have motivation for Aang that we don't know. So all these elements mixed in made that scene emotionally compelling, add the amazing choreography on top of that, and that's what makes a great action scene. Was it Zuko? I saw a little, like, thing. Oh, wow. You can't leave him there. Before the war started, I used to always visit my friend Kuzan. He was one of the best friends I ever had. And he was from the Fire Nation, just like you. If we knew each other back then, do you think we could have been friends too? That was a nice story by Aang, really digging in. I'm going to bed. I mean, Uncle Iroh knows, probably. He knows everything. Another great episode. A nice meeting between Aang and Zuko. A great action piece. Solid world building for the Fire Nation. And maybe the first villain? Hey, where's the fishing line? Oh, I didn't think you would need it, Sokka. I made you a necklace, Katara. I thought since you lost your other one. So very early on, I said they're probably setting up romance between Aang and Katara. Is this, is this the return to that? Someone's in love. Stop teasing him, Sokka. Aang's just a good friend. A sweet little oh, guy. Oh no! Just a Friend zone. Oh, that is definitely what that is. But everything was already under control. Aunt Wu predicted I'd have a safe journey. But the fortune teller was wrong. You didn't have a safe journey. You were almost killed. But I wasn't. You can't really tell the future. I guess you're not really getting wet then. I sympathize with Sokka as someone who. I guess it's more on the ultra-rational side. You see this a lot with people who are really smart. They have way too much confidence in their own reasoning abilities. Sometimes things are contextual. Oftentimes in the situation, the point is not to be right. The point is to, to bond, to achieve a kind of harmony that, that goes beyond fact. It just is about knowing your place in that moment, knowing your place in, in a group or with the other person, and kind of going with the flow rather than pushing your thoughts and your reasoning on others. It can become kind of tempting to fall in love with your own knowledge and your own your own critical thinking abilities. Part of the path to actually being smart is by letting go of that a little bit. You have to let go of your gifts sometimes in order to be healthy. I'm going to connect this to a bigger issue that I think about all the time, which is the idea that sometimes your biggest strengths become your biggest weaknesses. People who are smart, they get trapped in their own intelligence, and they can never get out of that. People who are kind and emotional, they can be too kind and emotional, and those people will make choices that don't make any sense just because, just out of empathy and emotion. It's a spectrum, and the important thing is not to feel or to be, or to think clearly, but to use both faculties in ways that suit you and suit the people around you relative to your goals and your and the group's goals. Instead of thinking that your gift, your ability, is the virtue in itself. Because it's not, it's just a tool. Balance is the key. How does this relate to Avatar? Well, Sokka and Katara have an interesting little thing going because Katara obviously is also a thinker and Sokka also definitely is emotional. But they kind of have certain traits that they lean on in situations or in, when they encounter problems. So Katara seems to lean towards like empathy, feeling, emotion, and in this case, fortune telling. Believe in what you see. And Sokka, he is kind of more the strategist. A little bit colder reasoning, like this is the way he sees things. He's trying to be more objective. He's a little bit less trustful. They're not exactly opposite ends, but they lean on different traits. My name is May, and I'm Aunt Wu's assistant. Ooh, looks like we got ourselves a little love triangle. I love how they depicted him as being, like, a bum. It's very nice to meet you. Very nice. Likewise. Mm. Is that the big ear guy who Aunt Wu predicted you'd marry? Uh-oh. <laughs> see, if, you, if you're too into someone, you can't function. You gotta let go a little bit. So, do you see anything interesting in my love line? <laughs> I see a great romance for you. Ooh. And he's a very powerful bender. I feel like the way they set that up, it means it's not Aang. It's another bender. So maybe Zuko? Your future is full of struggle and anguish. Most of it self-inflicted. But you didn't read my palms or anything. <laughs> I don't need to. It's written all over your face. <gasps> oh no, I feel attacked. That being said, like I do have experience with fortune telling and I, I love it. I don't believe that there's anything like magical about it, but it's just so much fun. You can't not enjoy it. Most of the people who have found my channel recently during the Avatar thing you guys probably don't know this, but this channel started as a couple channel with me and my girlfriend. When we first started the channel together, we, we got our tarot read twice. We weren't planning on doing it. We just went to events where they were doing tarot readings. And both the tar tarot readers said the same thing. They told me that I was going to succeed in my new endeavor, but it was going to tear me apart. 
and that in doing so I would find a new partner. <laughs> they didn't say romantic partner, but they said like just a new person. Whenever you have that experience, it's just, it's good because it makes you think. That's just a cool thing you can do. I don't know. <gasps> oh my! So is that good or bad? <laughs> You will be involved in a great battle. A battle whose outcome will determine the fate of the whole world. Yeah, yeah, I knew that all right. But did it say anything about a girl? Mm, that was a nice. Girl? I'm sorry, but I didn't see anything. Oh, look. I must have missed something. Trust your heart and you will be with the one see, you love. Speaking of reading really? the situation. But did she do the right thing by lying? I like you. Never mind. She said I'd be wearing red shoes when I met my true love. And how many times have you worn those shoes since you got that fortune? Every day. Then of course it's gotta come true! <laughs> really? It's lonely being like that. You just gotta let it go. So, Saka, you know some stuff about ladies, right? Some stuff. Don't. You've come to no, the right place. No, he doesn't. The number one mistake nice guys like you make? Being too nice. It's not about being nice or not nice. That's a mistake. It goes back to the leadership qualities thing that has kind of come up multiple times in the show. One is, are you capable? Like, can you do things? Can someone place their trust in you to get things done and do what you'll say and then create a good life? I think that's the first thing. And then longer term, it's about being being trustworthy, being good. Look at the example with Jet. It's immediately clear why somebody would be attracted to Jet when they first meet him because he just kicks ass and he's the leader of this tribe. You just see him as a super leader who can do whatever he wants. But then longer term, you stick around with Jet and you realize that he's gonna lead you off a cliff and you can't rely on him. And he's actually very emotionally unstable. You can't lean on him. The whole nice guys finish last thing, what that is, is like people who are not capable, they lean too heavily on doing what other people want them to do when they don't have the capacity to have romantic success. In absence of being interesting or cool or talented or something, they're just overly doting. They think that's kindness. There's actually nothing kind about that because it's manipulative. Real niceness comes from, from strength. Almost all good qualities come from strength. You can't really give from a place of weakness. It's like, I'm sure everyone's had the feeling where someone gave you something and it's not really a gift. It's like, they're just trying to get your attention. And immediately it's not, it doesn't feel like a, a gift at all. It feels like a curse because you don't want it. You don't want to have to owe them anything because you can feel where it's coming from. When someone who is strong and capable and competent gives you a gift, you're kind of floored. You're like, wow, this, this person who can manifest great things for himself or herself, they took the time to channel that energy towards me and it's super nice so it's not about niceness that's a very pervasive myth in my in my experience this is a very eclectic set of episodes today if you want to keep her interested you have to act aloof like you don't really care one way or the other the other side of that is that people mistake the aloofness thing it's not actually being aloof it's having the capability to be aloof when you want to be so the aloofness is kind of a signal that someone can handle that but the aloofness itself is not interesting. You can aloof yourself all you want with someone and they're not going to pay attention to you if you're not interesting. People confuse the signal for the source, you know? Hey, Katara. I didn't see you there. Hey, hang. That's okay. I'm busy with my own stuff. <laughs> oh, no. This is so genius, the way it's written. It's so real. It's interesting that it just happened to come up in the last episode about being, like, too obsessed with something. And then I just mentioned romance just randomly, and here we are. It's like a romance episode. It's critical that you maintain maximum aloofness. But my heart is telling me to get this glass. I love it. Oh no. Mm, a little twist. But she's not going to be wrong though. She's going to be right because they need to keep it ambiguous about whether or not she's a fortune, a real fortune teller. You can't rely on Aunt Wu's prediction. You have to take fate into your own hands. Look, can your fortune telling explain that? Can your science explain why it rains? Yes. Yes, it can. <laughs> You don't want to be unthinking, and you don't want to be too thinking. You don't want to be unfeeling, you don't want to be too feeling. You don't like me, do you? Aww. Of course I like you, but not the way I like you. I was very emotionally moved by that. The clouds are made of water and air. We ought to be able to bend them into any shape we want. That's like really taking fate into their own hands, wow. Oh my! How do you know that's a bad one? <laughs> Yes, do it, Aang. He is getting more powerful, it's not just me. Man, sometimes I forget what a powerful bender that kid is. Wait, what did yep. you just say? I suppose he is. Oh. But Aunt Wu predicted the village wouldn't be destroyed, and it wasn't. Right. I hate you. <laughs> it's okay, Sokka. Everything's gonna be alright. I sympathize with Sokka, I... but he's also wrong. 
Just as you reshape those clouds, you have the power to shape your own destiny. There's like a bigger thing to that that's just not fortune telling, but if you think about free will and destiny, it almost seems like free will and your ability to control the future coexist simultaneously with the fact that futures are predetermined. There's some philosopher I can't remember, he didn't believe in cause and effect. But for most people, we experience cause and effect, and so we can kind of trace a causal link between what's happening now and everything that happened in the past, and therefore extend that into the future. And so it seems like things are predetermined. But also, we experience free will and we make choices. People will explain that away by, well, your choices are based on faculties in your brain, and your, your brain is based on chemistry, and those processes are already set in motion. There may be something to that, but we also very clearly experience free will and do make choices. They seem on the surface to be incompatible, but maybe they're not. So like the fortune telling is kind of based on magic, but Aang also can choose his destiny, and maybe maybe those viewpoints are harmonious in some strange way. I don't know. Woozy. Oh, I love that episode. That just got me good. Very well written. Nuance. It's good character building. Great world building. Good writing by Aaron E. Has and John O'Brien. I'm fine with these world building episodes if they're this high quality. I don't need anything plot wise. I could watch this. There's just, there's a lot to think about and talk about just from these episodes alone. So thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you next time.